Hi everyone, I'm very happy today to have with me Professor Peter Tse. He is a neuroscientist and professor at the Psychological and Brain Sciences Department here at Dartmouth College. And today we're going to talk about the mind, consciousness, and free will. So Peter, thanks for being here oh, and welcome. Um, so let's start from the basics, right? Can you tell me a little bit about the history behind the mind-body problem? So the mind-body problem is the following. We seem to have these uh, facts about the universe that are mental. I see redness, I feel pain, and yet we assume under a physicalism that uh, these mental events must be realized in physical events, presumably neuronal activity. But the puzzle is, how can mental events be causal in the universe when uh, we assume that physics is sufficient to explain causation? Mm -hmm. So if a particle level description of reality is sufficient to account for uh, each stage of events over time, uh, there's, no, there's no role for mental events at all. Mm -hmm. So there's different parts to the mind-body problem. One is how can mental events be causal when they're realized in physical events, and if physical events are sufficient to explain causation, then what role are they playing? The other part is how mental events are realized. How is consciousness realized in neuronal events? So there's two puzzles. Okay, so one is basically you see the color red, and that's an input that is coming from the world into your brain, and somehow the brain is responding to that by creating some other event. Right. Okay. And then there's a second part, which is a more complicated one, which is how neuronal activity in the brain can give rise to consciousness. Right. And so, okay. you know, my field of neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, is reaching sort of the limits of knowledge. We don't know the neural code or the neural codes. Mm -hmm. We don't have a deep understanding of the neural basis of consciousness. Um, and we don't have a deep understanding of how, of how mental events can be causal in the universe. So there's lots to uh, do yet. Yeah. So what do you mean by the neural code? So the idea is that uh, neurons are doing something when they are making each other fire. Mm -hmm. And that that realizes um, not just a physical causal chain of events of neurons making other neurons fire, mm -hmm. it's realizing an informational ca uh, causal chain of events, which uh, to us can seem like a mental chain of events. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the sort of code, in a sense. Yeah. And, okay. Is it true, then, that, um, that people now understand, you know, all this neuroactivity, that somehow an impulse, like, not an impulse, sorry, uh, something you see or something you hear will fire locally, you know, some specialized group of neurons, but it could also fire sort of non-locally, meaning, you know, you have groups of neurons that somehow seem to be correlated, even if they're far away in the brain matter. Oh, sure. So I, th I think the correct level of analysis in the brain is not the single neuron or the single synapse or the single okay. membrane channel, but uh, the neural circuit. And neural circuits are, by definition, extended collections of neurons. So, for example, if I want to understand architecture, uh, the correct level of analysis is not a single brick. Mm -hmm. It's the relationships among the bricks. Right. And if I want to understand an um, information processing architecture in the brain, I, it, I can't look at a single neuron. So I could look at a simple s uh, neural circuit that allows, for example, a, 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 a leech to swim or a fish to swim. Mm -hmm. If I listen to a single uh, motor neuron, it, it might fire, you know, psh, psh, psh. But really what makes the fish or the leech follow this path is the sequence. This one fires, then this one fires, then this one fires, and then this one fires. So these... Uh, temporal relationships or phase relationships are very uh, important, mm -hmm. and you can't get at that by under, uh, understanding everything about a single neuron. You have to understand right. the chain of events. Okay, it's sort of like in physics, you know, you may learn a lot about the properties of a single atom by looking at its energy levels and things like that, which would be the equivalent of a single neuron, mm -hmm. but if you under, understand the behavior of a, of a chunk of matter, you need to go to very different approaches. And, and there, there seem to be uh, emergent properties, right? If exactly. I have a chlor chlorine ion and a sodium ion, they have very different properties. Yeah. But if I put them together and get salt, it's a completely different set of properties. Right. And you're thinking that something like that is related to consciousness, perhaps? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> metaphorically, I mean, I That's think... That's a jump, I know. But well, no, sure. Uh, let me put it this way. I think that... Um, 
bio biological systems when they first emerged on this planet mm -hmm. um, and maybe elsewhere in the universe really hit upon a kind of new type of physical causation and really emphasized that. And what I mean by that is that um, in, uh, energetic phase became very important for causal sequences. So mm -hmm. what do I mean by energetic phase? Well, normally people talk about you know energetic amplitude or frequency, and those are parts of energy. But phase is also key. So there's different kinds of phase relationships. One would be spatial phase relationships, and that would be shape, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, and uh, you can imagine a, a simple membrane channel, like a um, serotonin channel uh, mm -hmm. or a uh, receptor. And, um, take so these are things HD. flowing through neurons, through their synaptic? Through the membrane of a single neuron uh -huh. in the synaptic cleft, um, where an, a, a presynaptic neuron sends inputs to a postsynaptic neuron. Mm -hmm. Let's say <clears throat> I have a 5-HT2A receptor. It's uh, ID optimized to take serotonin as its input, mm -hmm. and it's sensitive to the shape of that serotonin molecule. Not, you know, the whole molecule, just this little part, sort of mm -hmm. like a key in a lock. Yeah. Now, weirdly, um, other molecules have evolved in plants that happen to just bind to this, mm -hmm. like the hallucinogens. Okay. And uh, so, um, LSD, psilocin, mescaline, all, all these other chemicals. So, in a way, this receptor doesn't care about the the, the mass of the molecule, the speed of the molecule, the just momentum, that just that little shape, of, that right. phase, the yeah. set of fa spatial phase relationships, or shape in this case, yeah. uh, unleashes a whole set of events, which makes that neuron fire. Um, at another level, say at the level of neurons, you can talk about temporal phase relationships being causal now, because mm -hmm. a, a neuron is essentially a coincidence detector, and let's say you know, five uh, presynaptic uh, inputs have to arrive at the same time, and if that happens, if five or more arrive at the same time within, say, 25 milliseconds, this neuron will fire. Mm -hmm. So now it's these temporal phase relationships or <coughs> coincidence or coincidence okay. that becomes causal. Now, uh, f you know, in traditional physical systems, this was not as essential. I'm not saying it wasn't essential at all, but it, it, you know, it's not the case, for example, that a, a rock, uh, that a waterfall is falling on, you know, the rock says, well, if the water falls with this pattern, I'll do that. And if mm -hmm. the water falls with that pattern, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Right? It was a much more sort of um, traditional or Newtonian conception of uh, causation. So, um, so if you were to define, and I know this is a hard one, if you were to define consciousness to a lay audience, right, how would you do that? Okay. What is consciousness? The simplest way to define it is, um, Consciousness is the domain of information that you can pay attention to, okay. volitionally. So you have three ideas that are very closely uh, interconnected. Consciousness, yeah. attention, and volition. Yeah. So let me give you an example. Um, you know, it has nothing to do with action. You might have locked-in syndrome and be lying in your bed, mm -hmm. but you could play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and then pay attention to uh, some instrument. Mm -hmm. And then you could rewind the tape and pay attention now to you know somebody's voice. So you're shifting your focus. In a you're sense. shifting your focus, and by paying attention to this versus that, mm -hmm. you're changing the content of your consciousness. So you can think of consciousness as the space within which this mental operator of volitional attention can do things, like attend to this versus attend to that. Now the contents of this space uh, is the result. Um, of a lot of pre-conscious and unconscious processing. Mm -hmm. So when inputs hit your retina, light impinges upon your retina, let's call it time zero. About 250 or maybe 350 milliseconds later, mm -hmm. you see something. Mm -hmm. Now, all the pre-conscious operations uh, that happen in that quarter or a third of a second are not conscious, but they create your consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you go from a pattern of... Um, pixels that are two-dimensional on the retina to a full-blown three-dimensional experience of the world. And this process uh, involves lots and lots of uh, processing mm -hmm. operations. And it's inferential. So for example, if I go outside of this building and I see that the ground is, um, say, wet, uh, I can't help but see it as wet because all my automatic pre-conscious processing in that quarter to one-third of a second came to the conclusion that the ground is wet. So you might call that a perceptual inference. It's mm -hmm. automatic, and it goes into the construction of your 
experience, mm -hmm. your subjective experience, which equals your consciousness. Um, but then based upon that, I can make later inferences or cognitive inferences and say, well, the ground is wet. Well, it must have rained. Mm -hmm. oh, but wait, the sky is blue. Can't have rained. Um, maybe a gardener came by and hosed the ground on. Oh, but wait, today's Sunday. And so I, this can go on forever. Mm -hmm. So we've got different kinds of inferential processes. One goes into the construction of your consciousness as you experience it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, these cognitive operations take that and draw other conclusions. Okay. So I would imagine that a lot of uh, animals um, would have a lot of the former, you know, the, yeah. the idea that, you know, oh, it's wet or it's snow or something, but not so much of the latter. Uh, well, I would agree that consciousness is probably very ancient and very widespread. Mm -hmm. And the reason you would want to have uh, consciousness uh, very early in evolution is because an animal should um, automatize everything that it can so that it's presented with the world as it is. Right. You know, and this idea goes way back uh, you know, to von Uxal in 1913 or something. He talked about the Umwelt of an animal, but it's really the world as it's experienced by an animal. Mm -hmm. So even a very, very distant animal uh, from us phylogenetically, like an octopus, I think is very likely uh, conscious, even though it's a mollusk, because the octopus has to ex um, have a representation of the world in which it operates. And so we can look at an octopus and we can infer that it has to be processing uh, information at a level higher than just features that would be detected at its retina. So mm -hmm. for example, there's a famous video by, uh, I think his name is Roger Hanlon, showing an octopus camouflaged against a piece of coral. And it's camouflaging itself not only in terms of texture and color, but in terms of the shape of its skin, it's actually changing the shape of its skin in three dimensions to match the shape of wow. the coral. That must mean, I think, y you can infer that the octopus's brain is processing three-dimensional shape, but that's not at, at its retina. So it also has to be representing things at a very high level. Mm -hmm. And if you want to use a computer an anal analogy, you want to pre-compile everything you can um, so that you are, can process things rapidly. Mm -hmm. So if you follow this kind of line of thinking, would it be true that there is sort of like a continuum or almost continuum anyway, of consciousness from you know, highly processing creatures like us to even very simple animals? I mean, a bacteria, I mean, has some level of response to the environment as well, which is its way of adapting to its environment and having some preconceived idea. Well, I don't know about ideas, preconceived responses, you know, right. like I should move that way because that's where the food is or that's where the warmth is or something. Would that be considered some sort of primitive level of consciousness according to you? Well, I think that, it, so I don't know, you know, but a bacterium or a paramecium might just be operating purely in terms of reflex. There mm -hmm. doesn't, I think what really uh, drove um, the evolution of consciousness was the uh, ability to entertain uh, possible paths of action um, that... Uh, you mean choice? Be, to make choices, to select among possible courses of action, okay. uh, you know, e even in the absence of inputs that would drive those actions. So, so let me give you an example. I think a lot of animals, a primitive animals, are driven by something in the stimulus. Mm -hmm. If this happens, the animal does this. You, know, you can think of that as reflex. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, in our ancestors, uh, the, there was the evolution of the capacity to consider options before actually doing them. Mm -hmm. So this gives rise to the possibility of an escape route from the danger of garden paths. So a garden path is when my locally best option is this, and then mm -hmm. my next locally best option is this, but at the end of it, I get eaten. Right? So uh, the opposite of that you can call a desert path. So let's say I want to find a mate or food. I can say, well, locally, I have to do this horrible thing and go through the desert and all this, but at the end of it, I get something good, mm -hmm. like a mate. And so by being able to um, not be driven by the stimulus, but yeah. be driven by internal representations, um, animals evolve the ability to, uh, as Karl Popper put it, the philosopher, he said, consciousness evolves so that our hypotheses w would die in our stead. Uh -huh. So instead of us dying, we could play things out and right. say, well, locally, I this see. is my best option, but at the end, I get yeah, eaten. That makes sense. So instead, I'll do this, right? So let me give an example, right? So imagine a fish, two kinds of fish. One fish has working memory, and one fish doesn't have working memory. Mm 
So the fish who doesn't have working memory sees a, a, a barracuda coming, and then it starts to flee, but then the barracuda goes behind a piece of coral. So now it cannot see the barracuda. Well, it has no working memory, so it cannot continue to represent the barracuda. So then it says, okay, no barracuda, and it starts eating again. Now this other fish, which has a working memory, the barracuda goes behind the coral. It can't see the barracuda, but it can still represent the barracuda in its working memory. And so it can say, well, the barracuda was going this way. It's probably going to come out here. I'm going to go that way. Mm. You can imagine which type of nervous, nervous system would survive better. Yeah. So working memory, mm. I think, was really uh, a revolution in nervous system design. And it was partially the beginnings of this, um, I think, this ability to play things out internally and consider that's possible uh, options. That's a, that's a great illustration. It's almost also related to the ability to strategize. Sure. Right? I mean, I mean, you can think of different strategies, and, and, and that obviously requires much more than simple reflexes. That's right. And I think that you know, a <coughs> full-blown flourishing of this ability to strategize uh, is our capacity to deliberate. You know? mm -hmm. we're, I think strategize sounds a little negative, but you know, we're constantly de deliberating about what, sh what should I do you know, tonight, over the next year, the next five years, and mm -hmm. so forth. And we play options out. And I think that this is really the heart of uh, free will, is mm -hmm. our imagination. It, you know, it's our ability to uh, consider our options, weigh them internally. And it, it relates also to consciousness because we can then see how they feel in, inside our own internal virtual reality. Like, oh, well, if I marry her, what would that be like 10 years from now? Hmm, you know, well, what if I marry her? You know, and so we can... Uh, let our hypotheses die in our stead. <laughs> <laughs> or, or get divorced instead. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so before we get into the free will issue, I wanted to ask you about the experiments that some people have been talking about where they say that somewhere the brain is making choices before you are aware of those choices. And the scientists that have been doing these experiments claim that that is sort of a the end of free will, or it explains free will as not being really a choice we make, but there is some sort of something else making that choice, which is very nebulous to me. So I just wanted you to explain what are these experiments and what do you think about them? Uh, okay, so there's two main classes of experiments that people invoke to uh, dismiss the idea of free will. One are the Libet experiments, and the other is the Wegener set of experiments. <coughs> Uh, I think you're mainly talking about the Libet experiments. So what Libet did is he had uh, people lift a finger at a time of their choosing, and they also were watching a clock. Mm -hmm. And the clock was going around pretty quickly. And they had to say the, the, the moment when this, where the second hand was at the moment when they first wanted to move their finger. Now when you use that, then they might say, um, you know, three o'clock. At three o'clock I first had the feeling of willing that I was going to move my finger, and then maybe at 4 o'clock I, I, in fact, did move my finger. Now, if you time lock um, uh, electroencephalogram signals to that time where they said that they uh, decided to or willed to or intended to move, well, you can actually see this um, buildup of a kind of a n potential or neural activity in a par part of the brain that's pretty much at the top center of your head. Um, and he called that the Breitschaftspotential or the, um, the readiness potential. And so there's pre-existing activity that precedes the, the feeling of moving. Mm -hmm. And people said, well, in a way the brain seems to have made the decision to move before you became aware consciously of moving. Mm. And uh, the readiness <laughs> potential exists. You know, we've, we've redone experiments. We've done, we've kind of redone, redone most of the Libet experiments, the key ones. Oh. And it's you, you mean you in you the mean, laboratory? Uh, uh, Adina and I and oh, okay. uh, Tali Wheatley and Walter Sennar are strong in our students. Uh -huh. And so the readiness potential, it turns out, uh, is uh, we, you know, no doubt it is a real thing. Um, but we now think that this readiness potential is really a precursor not to consciously freely willing. It's a precursor to uh, being about to move, whether you're conscious or not. So... Um, we did these other experiments where we um, hypnotize people to, uh, you know, we, we hypnotize them and we give them a uh, suggestion. You know, when this happens on the screen, you will lift your finger. And then we bring them out. 
So now they're fully conscious, just like you and me, but they have this pre-hypnotic suggestion in their head. And then something happens on the screen and they move their finger. But from so their point stays. of view, it just kind of happens for no reason. Uh -huh. uh, in that case, we see the readiness potential too. So, you know, my opinion is that the readiness potential, it was just sort of a red herring mm -hmm. and it <clears throat> led the field astray. It, I think it's largely irrelevant to the issue of free will because free, do free will doesn't reside in this domain of sort of um, meaningless, um, you know, pseudo-random finger movements. It resides in the exactly. domain of human ima imagination, considering our options and playing things out. And that's an entirely different brain process than uh, preparing to m make a meaningless motor action. That is exactly uh, what I think as well. <laughs> but um, so does that mean that um, if you could think of animals having free will, would there be any animals or any animal action that would represent free will from the part of the animal? Is that something which is really a human Okay, well, now we have to define what we mean by free will. Yeah. So uh, I think there's a lot of confusion in the field, mm -hmm. in philosophy and in neuroscience, uh, because people are talking past each other because they're operating on the basis of different definitions of free will. Yes. So, you know, a, 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 your basic definition would be um, the ability to choose in a manner that is consistent with your intentions or d desires, unhindered uh, or unforced by outside forces. Okay. Now, there's nothing in that definition about events possibly having uh, turned out otherwise. You know, so this definition is compatible with the idea of determinism, that the universe is sort of like a movie. It just starts at the Big Bang and just plays out like a movie. There's only one future. So if this is your definition of free will, you know, you can be a so-called compatibilist. You could say, according to this definition of free will, uh, free will is compatible with determinism because all I need is to have my nervous system's decisions affect causally my subsequent actions unconstrained by events outside of my nervous system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's your first order low level, you know, compatibilist definition of free will. Now, you can add to that the uh, condition that events or choices had to have the, had the possibility of turning out otherwise. Now, by definition, that's incompatible with determinism because under determinism, nothing can have turn out otherwise. Right? Mm. So incompatibilism um, means that free will is incompatible with determinism. And under this definition of free will, where th events had to have turned out, had, had to have had the possibility of turning out otherwise, by definition, free will is incompatible with determinism because this requires indeterminism. So let's call this first order libertarian free will. Now, there's a th second order uh, libertarian free will that says it's not enough just to have had the possibility to choose otherwise. You have to have the capacity to choose what kind of chooser you're going to be, sort of a meta free will. Mm. And so this we can call <coughs> second order libertarian free will. It's also incompatible with determinism. So now we've got three definitions of free will. One is compatible with determinism. Then there's sort of first order libertarian free will, which is incompatible with determinism. And second order in, um, uh, libertarian free will, which is also incompatible with determinism. I think animals have this for sure. So a tiger uh, can uh, consider some problem. Right? How, let's say it's in the jungle of Sumatra. It sees a tapir mm -hmm. and it wants to kill it. So it can consider, well, I, I could do this or I can go around this way or I can go around this way. And it will consider its options under some set of criteria. What are the, this, this, the best, the sneakiest way to get to the taper so it doesn't notice me? What's mm -hmm. the shortest path? So forth. And it can generate options internally, I think. Mm -hmm. And it has uh, that kind of consciousness. It has perceptual consciousness. It feels emotions. It feels um, it, uh, uh, desires. And it can consider options. So it has uh, consciousness. It has this first order libertarian free will and it can choose, say, this path. Mm -hmm. But if you rewound the universe to this moment, it might have chosen that path. Right. But what the tiger lacks is the second order uh, libertarian free will, which is the capacity to choose what kind of chooser you will be in the future. Now, we humans have this capacity. You know, you could say, um, I want to learn, uh, you know, Swahili. And you don't speak Swahili, Swahili now, in fact, it's just meaningless to you. If you heard Swahili, you couldn't interpret it. But what you could do is you could say, I, I 
you know, I have some sort of criteria that I want to meet. I want to, you know, learn a second language. I want it to be something relevant to my future um, job as ambassador to uh, Kenya. Okay, well, the logical thing to do is learn Swahili. You can go get a book. And in a year of effort and practice, you will be a new kind of human being that has a nervous system that can process Swahili and produce it. A tiger can't do anything like that. I don't think a tiger even can consider, I want to be a different kind of tiger in a year from now. I want to be a vegetarian tiger. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, right. there's a lot of confusion in the field because there's different meanings or definitions of free will. Yeah. I believe that the human brain realizes not only the first order, first level. Uh, libertarian free will, the capacity to consider options and that our mental processes can turn out otherwise. But we have this meta free will or second order free libertarian free will that allows us to become new kinds of nervous systems in a year from now or 10 yeah. years from now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This is an excellent definition of free will. I really, okay, that clarifies a lot. Um, so, a last question for you then changing subjects a little bit. You know, there's a lot of debate now about artificial intelligence and if we humans are going to be able at some point in building machines that are not just following rules in a program like the ones that we have now, but that actually have some level of self-awareness. Um, what's your position on that? Do you think that this is uh, something that is achievable? Do you think it's a pipe dream? Well, I think given computers as they are now, mm -hmm. it will never be accomplished. That doesn't mean that in the future versions of computing systems that it can't be accomplished. I mean, so the brain is just manifestly not a computer, right? So mm -hmm. the, the dominant metaphor of uh, my field, neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience psychology, is that the brain is a kind of computer. Mm -hmm. And this just fails, right? Because the, there's no software hardware distinction in the brain. Uh, no computer is rewiring itself on a millisecond time scale, um, and computers are not conscious, right? So we, we, we know that our governing metaphor is false. Mm -hmm. um, and I would argue that, uh, you know, computers as they currently realized are very algorithmic. And mm -hmm. algorithms, um, you know, one simple way to think of it is, you know, is, is a thread of decisions. You know, there's this input, and then there's a yes-no decision, and then a single... Um, output. Um, whereas the neurons are just radically different from that. They're not just taking, you know, a single thread of input. They're taking 10,000 inputs, integrating them, and then setting th hundreds or thousands of inputs out. Um, so, you know, I'm skeptical, I, and yet we are physical systems. Evolution c discovered the path to consciousness. The fact that we're experiencing now is proof that it's possible mm -hmm. for a physical system to be conscious. Right. But, um, you know, I look at the latest, greatest stuff in AI, and I'm, I'm very skeptical, you know. I mean, so the latest, greatest thing right now would be these sort of uh, deep learning networks. Mm -hmm. You know, people at first were happy about 10 layers, and now there's hundreds of layers, right? Mm -hmm. And these things are impressive. They can, um, for example, uh, not only, say, recognize that this painting is a Manet or Monet or Van Gogh, they can actually uh, take a photograph and rework it to look like a Van Gogh or re... Mm -hmm. So th that's impressive, but um, that's nowhere near what we are doing. So what we are doing is uh, we have mental models. Mm -hmm. um, we're not just taking input and processing it in a bottom-up way. We have mental models of how uh, things work. And we can use those mental models to uh, operate not only in the world, like driving a car. Mm -hmm. I can use those mental models in my internal virtual reality, which is also conscious. Right? So there's consciousness of the outside world, and there's my internal virtual reality, which can also be conscious. Uh, you might call that daydreaming, fantasy, mm -hmm. you know, dreaming, um, working memory. And I can use these mental models to uh, carry out operations, like play things out. I see nothing like that in any computer system now. Uh, there's nothing like uh, mental models. That doesn't mean that they can't eventually be instantiated, but my mm -hmm. guess is by the time that computer science realizes anything like that, computers themselves will look radically different. They'll end up looking a lot more like the brain mm -hmm. than these sort of, uh, this sort of this Neumann architecture. Okay, and so, so to finalize, what do you think of this whole um, debate about assuming 
some sort of true artificial intelligence is possible in the future, should we be afraid? Okay, so maybe some people have seen this movie Ex Machina or there's this other one. I mean, I know that there's a, a lot of worry about um, robotization, mm -hmm. automatization, and in terms of economics, I mean, that's something to worry about. Right. Now, um, then the question is, let's say that we create um, robots that can actually do things. Let's say that we want to create a company that will make robots that are essentially slaves. So I, the, the, in order for that to be possible, I have to give a command to this robot, like, do the dishes. Yes, and they'll do it. Um, and uh, so a general purpose robot like that, I think, would only be able to, uh, to really do that if it had mental models uh, that we have. Mm -hmm. Right, because there's so much mm -hmm. ambiguity. If I say, you know, um, change the tires, well, you have to know change the tires on the car and which car, the car with the, you know. Now, where do our mental models come from? Partly they come from our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I know what it's like to feel pain means I understand what it's like for you to feel pain because I have my mental model of my pain. I can generalize that. So the, the puzzling or the funny or ironic thing is that if we get to the point where we create, ro create robots who can actually do useful things and uh, become our slaves, mm -hmm. they would probably have to also be conscious uh, in order for them to understand what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But if they're conscious, then th if we face all the normal problems of human slavery, right. it would be immoral yeah. because they can feel pain. Yeah. And so I in the end, it would be uh, just as immoral to have a conscious robot that can feel pain that we're enslaving as to enslave a human being. Great. I think on that note, <laughs> I would like to thank you very much for this. Right. And um, You're welcome. looking forward to your course coming yes. soon. Yes, yep. 2018. Absolutely. Great. All right. Thank you. Yep. Great, Peter. Thanks. Thanks.